Bible reading is Proverbs chapter 3. That's where we've made it up to in our sermon series. Proverbs chapter 3. We're reading the whole chapter. It's quite a long, um, so follow it through. Proverbs chapter 3 then says this. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them round your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, then you will win favour and a good name in the sight of man, a God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honour. Her ways are pleasant ways, and her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the watery depths were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. There will be life for you, an ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. Do not withhold good from those whom it is due when it is, your pow- when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbour, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when you already have it with you. Do not plot harm against your neighbour who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse anyone for no reason when they have done you no harm. Do not envy the violent or choose any of their ways. For the Lord detests the perverse, but takes the upright into his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favour to the humble and oppressed. The wise inherit honour, but fools get only shame. Uh, Open your Bibles again to Proverbs chapter 3. While I was prepping this this week, I realised I probably should have split the chapter in two. um, Because there's a lot lot in Proverbs chapter 3. So there may well be things that we don't cover this morning. uh, In which case, go away and have a think about it further on during the week. Um, But we are going to attempt to work our way through the entire thing um, this morning and cover... Some of the kind of the big themes in it, really. I say that chapter three has got a lot in it. We've actually already covered quite a lot in the first two chapters of Proverbs. Uh, you'll know if you've, if you've heard those over the last few weeks. We've thought about things like the fear of the Lord, which is a big, uh, big subject. That idea that we joyfully stand in awe of God, that we delight uh, and reverence him at the same time as him who is the God over all the earth, but the one who invites us uh, to call him Father. We thought about how this is God's world that we live in, and therefore listening to what God says will enable us to live well. Makes sense, doesn't it? If it's God's world and he's designed it and authored it and made us, that living the way he says we should live makes sense. We thought about seeking wisdom. Constantly in these early chapters of Proverbs, the father is speaking to his son and saying, seek wisdom, get wisdom, find understanding. Thought about how we do that is to seek Jesus, ultimately. We've thought about how then uh, the paths that we walk in are full of different hidden traps. 
things that would entice us away from God, things that would seek to bring us down, things that would uh, tempt us to sin. And yet, in God's word, wonderfully what he has done is expose those traps and showed us what they are and where they are so that we can best avoid them. We also thought about how God is the one who has our backs, that he, even if everything around us would fail, he remains sure and certain he doesn't abandon us. Well, in chapter 3, as you probably heard as I read it earlier, the benefits of wisdom are all over the place. Everything from life to peace and from safety to grace are benefits of wisdom, according to Proverbs chapter 3. And so even that simple read-through, we, we, we should say, shouldn't we, that then pursuing wisdom or seeking wisdom or wanting wisdom is a no-brainer kind of question. Right? It's obvious. Why, if wisdom is that good, why would, why would any of us choose the opposite? Why would any of us choose folly when wisdom is so beneficial? And the reality is, if we're really honest with ourselves, we take a, a step back and pause. The, re, the reason we don't seek wisdom is because we like to rely on ourselves. And we'll see that in a few minutes. It spells it out very clearly in Proverbs 3 that that's our problem. But let's first address what may well be the elephant in the room for some of you, and if it's not the elephant in the room for you yet, it will be when I mention it, okay? Which is this. Verses 2, 4, 10, and 16 in particular sound like what? They sound like the prosperity gospel, right? Get this, you'll get all of this good stuff. Do this, you'll get this blessing. Let me read them for you, the things they say. They will prolong your life many years, bring you peace and prosperity, favor and a good name. Your barns will be filled to overflowing. Your vats will be brimming with new wine. You get riches and honor. That sounds like the prosperity gospel. It sounds like what gets preached in lots of places. Come here, do this, give this money, tick these boxes, you will get X, Y, Z. And if you've been part of this church for any time, you'll know that the prosperity gospel is garbage. Okay? I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'm not bothered about saying it again. It's rubbish. It's absolute rubbish. It is a load of crap peddled by people who want to get rich. That's what it is. It's a message that claims to be good news, but is actually terrible news. It's a message that says Jesus wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. And if you have enough faith, or you give enough money, or whatever it is, you'll get it. It basically promotes the idea that if you name it and claim it, it will be yours in Jesus. And yet, you just, you can't marry that up with the Bible. You don't have to read the Bible and be very clever to see that that doesn't fit. The prosperity gospel doesn't really want to know God. The prosperity gospel wants to treat God like a vending machine. Give you stuff. Prosperity gospel has no place for the discipline that verse 11 and 12 talks about in here from God. The prosperity gospel has no answer for why faithful believers suffer in this life. The prosperity gospel would never say with Paul, I will gladly suffer the loss of everything for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. Now before we get sucked into a separate sermon on the prosperity gospel, which is not the intention this morning... We have to say, well, how are these verses not preaching the prosperity gospel in? It's all right telling us the prosperity gospel is nonsense, Matt, but this still sounds a bit like that. The difference here is that the prosperity gospel is is, is saying that's that's everything. That's all all you need and want. Forget God, just get stuff. Here, we've seen that the beginning of wisdom or the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. That's where it starts. And actually what this is telling us in Proverbs 3 is if we, if we rightly fear the Lord first and then we seek to live his ways wisely, these are the kinds of things, the incentives for living wisely. The peace and the prosperity and the riches it talks about are much bigger and better than any material blessings in the here and now. That peace, that prosperity is is more actually about fulfillment and satisfaction and contentment and wholeness and rest in God. And there are also blessings that go beyond the grave. Hope and joy and eternal life forever. 
So let's come to the chapter and walk our way through the verses. We're going to pull out and highlight particular things. Um, like I say, I probably should have split it more. One commentary I was looking at that was based on somebody's sermon series did three sermons on Proverbs 3. <laughs> they were all a lot longer than this one this morning. So there's, there's lots of things to look at, plenty of things for you to go away and think about as well that we, we won't get a chance to cover. But did you notice in the first five verses, they repeated your heart? So in the first five verses, your heart is repeated three times. That's key. The commands are to be kept in your heart. Love and faithfulness are to be written in your heart. And you are to trust the Lord your God with all your heart. In other words, the writer of the Proverbs is telling us we need wisdom at the deepest level. Because the heart is not just that lump of muscle that pumps the blood around your body when we read it in Proverbs. The heart is the very centre of who we are as people. And by nature, our hearts are sinful. We, we, live, we live for ourselves as, as people. We, we trust our own desires. We uh, rely upon our own judgment. And we walk in our own ways. Which means that verses 5 and 6 are completely radical, aren't they? Look at them again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. I, I imagine for, for some of you who've been Christians for a while uh, and who like to send encouragements and cards to people, you've probably sent that verse on a card, on a WhatsApp message. You've probably seen it on a poster. You may have it on a plaque in your house. And these are the memory verses we did in the holiday club here a few years ago, and I, I'm going to spare you me singing to you. But I know these verses because we learnt them in that holiday club, so they, they're, they're to a tune in my head. <laughs> you might just know them off by heart, but to me, there's a song that goes with it. And they are great verses. I'm not about to tell you, pull down your plaques and don't send it on a message to people. They are great verses to send, but if you actually pause to think about what they say, they're very demanding. They're a huge call. They're not just a nice, woolly, fluffy, comforting set of verses. The demand there is massive, isn't it? Those verses say it is all or nothing. They call us to repent of trusting our own ways and trust God instead. These verses tell us that we then need to listen to what God says and do it rather than what we naturally do, which is to look for somebody to tell us to do what we've already decided to do. Because in reality, that's it, isn't it? We ask people for advice. We've got an idea in our head what we're going to do. We ask people for advice, and when we finally get to the person who says this thing was already in our head, great, I'll take their advice. I did take advice, just happened to be the advice that I'd already decided to do myself. <coughs> These verses say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. These verses tell us to shut out and ignore and not listen to the voices in the world that basically say, listen to yourself, trust yourself, be yourself, follow your heart. If it feels right, do it. That is the mantra of our generation, isn't it? The Bible said, forget all that. Don't do any of that. Ignore those voices, listen to, trust in the Lord. We are being told in these verses that the Christian life is one of submitting every desire, every decision, and every dream to the Lord. And trust that he knows best. That's big, isn't it? Those verses are huge. But it does tell us that if we do that, we will find... That following him, submitting to him, trusting him with all our heart, he will make our paths straight. So the question we've got to ask ourselves if we're Christians this morning is, is God the deciding factor in the choices that we make? Is it his will that we're seeking to do? Are we honestly asking him to align our desires with his word? When was the last time we made a decision that was a surprise to our non-Christian friends or family because it went completely against the values of the world and fitted with the Lord's? 
If that never happens, then maybe actually what we're doing really is still leaning on our own understanding or on other people's understanding rather than on the Lord's. When was the last time we, we came to God's word, either reading it in our own time or sat and listened to it preached and felt God's word of correction or rebuke? See, if that's also never happened to us, then one of two things is true. Either we're perfect or we're not really submitting to his ways. How many of us want to claim to be perfect? Next time we read words like this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. We need to remember how radical and all-encompassing they are. We can try and water them down, but, well, that would be foolish, wouldn't it? These words tell us that the Lord wants to speak to our hearts constantly through his words. Because he constantly wants to mould and change and shape us to be more like Jesus. Because that's what's best for us. I mean, look at what the next verse says. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. I bet none of us have got those on a fridge magnet. See, the, the negative instruction comes there because, and later on in the, in the chapter, because by nature we do rather than don't. We do think we're wise in our own eyes. We think we're right most of the time. Maybe all of the time. We think we can do it. We've got it sorted. And the antidote to that is back to the root that we said right in the very beginning. Fear the Lord. And then shun evil. The passage then takes us to two big things really in verses 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 where Christian living should be very distinct from the world around. And the first is in how we use our money. Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops, then your barns will be overflowing with wine and your vats will brim over with, uh, sorry, overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. One of the things the Bible clearly tells us as you read through scripture is that everything we have comes from the hand of the Lord. Everything we have has been graciously given to us. You might say, yeah, but Matt, I work 40 hours a week for my pay slip. Yeah, but God has given you that job and the skills to do that job, and so it all comes from him. See, if we're Christians here, again, the, the, the challenge is, are we using what we've been given to honour the Lord? Or are we wasting what we've got on pointless things? Or are we hoarding it for a rainy day? See, the biggest influence on what we should do with our money and our stuff should be God's. The biggest influence shouldn't be, have I got the latest gear? Is my interior design of my house on trend? Have I got all the gadgets that people say are cool? These verses are talking about giving the first and the best of what we've got to the Lord. Not the leftovers after we've bought what we want. Now, I've used this example before. Some of you will have heard it. Some of you won't because it's a little while since I've, I've used it. Um, but if you've heard it before, don't turn off. Just listen to it again and indulge me. Uh, my granddad was a miner. He worked in the Durham coal fields for 40 odd years of his life. Uh, and in those days, particularly if you're a young people used to get paid in cash in a brown envelope at the end of a week. So his final shift, he'd get an envelope, he'd bring the money home, and he'd give it to my gran, who was the family treasurer. My gran would then have a set of jars on the windowsill in her kitchen. And she used to separate the money out into different jars for different things. Things like food and coal, because that's how you heated your house, or household items or clothing or whatever it might be. But the first jar was the Lord's jar. Before anything else was taken out, money went in there. If putting money in the Lord's jar meant then they had to wait a bit longer to buy a new pair of shoes, then they waited. They didn't have a lot. They didn't leave anything for their kids either. The money my gran had left when she died was just enough to cover, cover her funeral. And she lived in a council house for the entirety of her life. But what they did leave were lives that were full of joy and love. And what they did leave was a legacy of honour in the Lord. That's the equivalent of giving of the first fruits to the Lord. The first 
and the best. Now you might say, well, nowadays, Matt, I get paid directly into the bank, and I don't get paid weekly, I get paid monthly, and the tax man takes his cut first. That is true. You might say, the student loans company have also got their hand in my pocket too. So double whammy. So I reckon for some of us, it's not actually possible for us to give first and best to the Lord in the same way I've just described. But I actually think then if we're going to give the first and the best to the Lord, there is a very good argument from these verses to give into the Lord from our gross pay, not our net pay. That makes sense? There was no tax man dipping his hand in to my granddad's paycheck before then in the same way. The money went into his hand. That was, that was all of it. Things were paid later. These instructions were given before the tax man would get his slice of the pie first. I think giving our best and first to the Lord is there to show us to be thankful, to trust his provision, and as part of our worship. I also think these verses have got a lot to say about not cheating the system, not seeking to avoid paying tax uh, by doing a whole lot of other jobs on the side, cash in hand. I don't think we're honouring the Lord if we, we do it that way. What we should ask ourselves is, again, when was the last time we did something with our money that was so radically different from the world around us? When was the last time we maybe used our retirement money in a different way to our friends? If you fast forward to the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, some of you read that in a big Bible read not long ago. The model and motivation for giving that Paul gives is Jesus Christ leaving the riches of heaven and coming to the poverty of the earth in order to save us. The gospel then should make Christians the most generous people in the world. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Where we spend our time and our money and our energy shows what matters most to us. It shows who or what is Lord of our lives. And so if the first and best of our money doesn't go to the Lord, then he's not Lord of our wallets. And before you wonder, and before you ask whether I'm starting to drift into prosperity gospel and asking people to give large amounts of money and whether this is going to cripple people who are poor, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 12. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. To steal this from a, a friend of mine who wrote some stuff on this chapter a, a while ago, it's not about the act of giving, it is not about the amount given, but it is about the attitude of the heart in giving. The second thing that this passage particularly challenges us in is, is with regards to discipline. Look at verses 11 and 12 again. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. I mean, none of us likes being told off, do we? Kids, do you like being told off by your parents? Do you like being told off at school by your teachers? None of us, none of us likes it. We don't like being given jobs that are hard work to do either, do we? We like, we like the easy life. We, we want comfort. We want no hassle. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Just think, yeah, no, no hassle, ease, comfort, perfect, job done. But these verses clearly tell us that discipline and rebuke come from the Lord for our good. They come because he loves us, not because he hates us. Hebrews 12 quotes these verses and tells us to endure hardship as discipline, knowing that God is doing it so that we'll grow in holiness. It also tells us we don't like discipline at the time. It's like the writer of the Hebrews anticipates us. Yeah, but discipline's hard, man. Yeah, we don't like discipline at the time, but when we look back, we see the good fruit from it. Hardship is often God's way of teaching us and training us and changing us. And again, I nicked this illustration, but it worked out quite well because of what we recently watched. We recently watched this uh, film again with our kids, the Karate Kid. 
the original one, not the remake. We watched the, we watched the original Karate Kid film from the 1980s. If you're not familiar with it, a kid called Daniel LaRusso asks an older Japanese man by the name of Mr. Miyagi to teach him karate so that he can defend himself against the high school bullies. Well, Mr. Miyagi says, yeah, right, turn up at my place uh, tomorrow morning. And over the course of a few days, Mr. Miyagi gets Daniel to wax his cars, to sand his floors, to paint his fence, and to paint his house. And after a while, Daniel has had enough. He thinks he's been exploited for slave labor, and he has it out with Mr. Miyagi, who tells him to stop, and then shows him how every action of waxing on and waxing off, and painting the fence, and sanding the floor, has all been given the building blocks for karate. And so the sore arms and the blisters and the early mornings and the late nights were all moulding and shaping Daniel into a karate expert. It's like that with the way the Lord works with us. God is working for our good when he disciplines us and rebukes us, when he trains us. It might be hard, but it is worth it in the end. He knows, God knows, what is best for us and knows how to bring it about. Maybe you sat here this morning and the Lord is disciplining you or rebuking you or convicting of your sin. Don't despise it, these verses say. Don't despise it, accept it. Hold on to him through it. Repent of that sin and ask him for the help to change because he's doing it for your good and for his glory. Nancy and I have been reading a little book on Psalm 23 uh, on an evening. Uh, and the last little section we looked at was about walking through the valley of the shadow of death, which if you know Psalm 23, that's, that's part of that psalm. And what was emphasized was in that psalm, the, the Lord leads the psalmist into the valley of the shadow of death. The Lord hasn't got lost. It's not like the Lord sat and wasn't working that day and he went the wrong way. The Lord is also with the psalmist there. He doesn't abandon the psalmist, in the valley of the shadow of death. And the Lord walks all the way through the valley. He doesn't drag him running, kicking and screaming through it. He doesn't rush out the other end. See, it's no accident when those trials and tribulations come. There's no mistake made by the Lord. And so the call is to stick with him, to keep following him. Or to put it in the words of this chapter later on, my son, do not let wisdom out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life for you. An ornament to grace your neck. They will go, then you will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. Jump back a few verses from that to verses 14 to 17, and you find again, don't you, the value of wisdom. It's clearly presented. Remember those MasterCard adverts? There was a whole bunch of them. Various things you bought. Here's my example. This is not a real one. But you you buy a hat, costs you a tenner. You buy a t-shirt of the band that you're going to see, that costs you 20 quid. You buy the gig ticket, which now might be 100 quid. It's a lot more expensive than I used to go to gigs. And then memories are made singing at the top of your voice under a beautiful night sky, and that is priceless. There are some things money can't buy, but for everything else, there's MasterCard. Well, the Bible here in verses 14 to 17 tells us that wisdom is better than gold. It is better than silver. It is more valuable than precious stones. It is more than anything money can buy, even MasterCard. It is priceless. Nothing compares to wisdom. And like we said at the very beginning of this series, if we want wisdom, we've got to come to Jesus. Because the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of understanding is to rightly fear the Lord. And we can only rightly fear the Lord when we repent and believe in Jesus. Which takes us to two of Jesus' own stories, doesn't it? And this value of wisdom. There's a man, Jesus says, who buys a field because he he knows there's treasure in it. He sells everything he's got so he can buy the field so that he can get the treasure that is greater than what he had before. Or you get a wealthy man who comes to Jesus and asks how to get eternal life. And Jesus says, well, give up everything. Give it to the poor and follow me. But he won't sell that. 
because he doesn't think it's worth as much as Jesus. Getting wisdom, following Jesus, it might cost you everything in this life. It might cost you friends, family, respect, career, and so on. The Bible says it's worth it. It is more precious than gold or silver or precious stones. Why? Look at verse 18. Wisdom, she is a tree of life. To those who take hold of her, to those who hold fast to her will be blessed. A tree of life. Now again, in scripture the tree of life is in Genesis and it is in Revelation chapter 22. And access to the tree of life is God's gift to grant or deny. So Adam and Eve are denied access to the tree of life when they sin and rebel against God, they get kicked out of the garden. But then Christians, those who have repented of their sin and trusted in Jesus, are given access to the tree of life in the new creation. Why or how? Through faith in Jesus alone, through rightly fearing the Lord, through holding fast to Jesus and persevering to the end. Taking hold of wisdom then means listening to the word of God. It means trusting the Lord. It means being saved by Jesus Christ. And so again, if you sat here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your saviour and Lord, then he is calling you to repent of your sin and ask for mercy. Will you come to him and ask for the forgiveness that can only come through his bloodshed on the cross? Will you come to him believing that he has done everything that is needed for you to be saved? You, know, you can do that sat where you are right now. You don't have to go anywhere special. You don't have to, have to say a particular set of words. You can do it in the quietness of your own heart by simply saying sorry to God, thank you to God, and please, sorry for your sins, thank you for Jesus dying in your place, and please save me and help me to live for you. Now we've covered a lot of ground and there'll be still verses in there we've not really touched on. But there's a little bit more to say right at the very end. Verses 27 to 31. There's a whole set of do not statements. And we said earlier, don't we? We need the do nots quite often because by nature we do the opposite. We do. And in summary, all of those examples in verses 27 to 31 tell us how to love our neighbour. They are an outworking of Jesus' greatest or second greatest commandment. When he says the second greatest commandment is this love, sorry, the first is love the Lord your God, will your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is love your neighbour as yourself. But these do-nots are only possible if we started by fearing the Lord. Remember, this isn't just instructions to tell people how to live. It's not really possible to do any of this or have any of this if we have not started with the fear of the Lord. If the Lord is not in his rightful place, you might as well forget the book of Proverbs. And again, the father doesn't leave his son with instructions that don't have good reason. Look at the last verses again. For the Lord detests the perverse, but takes the upright into his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks the proud mockers, but shows favour to the humble and oppressed. The wise inherit honour, but fools get only shame. It is the contrast again, isn't it, between wisdom and folly. The perverse, the wicked, the mockers, the fools. They are detested, cursed, mocked and shamed by the Lord. The upright, the righteous, the humble, the oppressed, and the wise are befriended, blessed, received grace, and honoured by the Lord. Again, put those lists side by side. What, what are we going to choose? We've got a choice to make. Will we lean on our own understanding and therefore fall into that category of the, those who are foolish? Will we go our own way? Will we stay rebels against God? Will we keep listening to the voices of the world? If that's the route we choose, the Bible makes it very clear that in the end we will be rejected by the Lord. Because we will have to pay, face the punishment for our own sins. And therefore we will spend eternity away from the Lord in all of his goodness. And we will have to endure wrath forever. Or we can trust the Lord. We can listen to his voice. We can lean not on our own understanding. We can hear the gracious warnings that he gives. We can repent of our sin and believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved. And if we do that, we'll be forgiven. We'll be accepted. We'll be welcomed into the family of God. The Lord will be with us as this 
chapter of Proverbs describes. The Lord will lead us and he will change us and he will keep us. And we will know true life, both now and in eternity with the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we ask that as we consider what we've looked at in Proverbs, and there's lots of things to think about, where we need to see your discipline and rebuke of us, would you graciously and gently do that, and by your spirit help us to respond rightly in repentance and faith, where we, we haven't yet trusted in Jesus, but you are calling us to this morning, might again by your spirit you enable people to repent of their sin and, and trust in Jesus alone. Where actually you want to encourage us to keep going because it's hard and we're thinking about not trusting you and trusting something else. Help us to submit our desires, the deep desires of our heart to your will and to your ways. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.